November 29, 1864. Up at 3 a.m., General Hood went to Chaplain Quintard of the 1st Tennessee, now serving with Army Headquarters. The chaplain had prayed God's blessing, guidance, and direction upon him. General Hood replied, Thank you, Doctor. That is my hope and trust. And as he turned away, he stated these parting words. The enemy must give me fight, or I will be in Nashville before tomorrow night. On the afternoon of the 28th, General Forrest had crossed his cavalry at four fording sites further east up Duck River. Those troopers had pushed back the Federal Cavalry outposts and sentinels, creating a passage for the infantry that would soon follow. The same day, a working party had been sent to Davis's Ford to build out the pontoon site, but a delay with the arrival of the pontoon train caused more than an hour delay in the final construction of the bridge. On the morning of the 29th, with a late start, Confederate infantry began crossing Duck River as rapidly as possible along muddy roads and fields in their race to Spring Hill. The Federal Army under Schofield was still massed north of Columbia along Duck River. Only the wagon train, comprising more than 800 wagons and the reserve artillery of the Army, had begun a retrograde to Spring Hill, a town that Schofield had ironically supposed to be out of harm's way in the event of an engagement. In Columbia, Confederate General S.D. Lee remained behind with two divisions of his infantry corps and all the army's artillery except two batteries of cannon. His job was conduct a feint operation in front of Schofield's main force. It was hoped this action would maintain the Federal Army's attention to the south. The plan initially worked well, although with a late start. Confederate infantry marched as rapidly north toward Spring Hill as conditions would allow. To the west, the Federal wagon train would stretch over a distance of nearly 10 miles in length, and at about noon the lead elements began to arrive in the environs of Spring Hill, while the rear of the train had not even begun its movement. A division of the 4th Corps had been sent with the train as a guard. Colonel Emerson Opdyke's brigade was the lead element of this force. Several miles east, General Forrest's cavalry had consolidated near Rally Hill that morning and pressed back the Federal cavalry all morning long, forcing the Federal troopers to practically disengage near Mount Carmel on Lewisburg Pike. From that point on, the Federal cavalry continued to withdraw towards Franklin, with only a minimal rebel force in their pursuit. A few small Federal cavalry detachments still operated in the vicinity of Spring Hill, and these detachments were all that stood between the village and the rebel cavalry after they had turned west from near Mount Carmel in order to press forward on the small hamlet. Shortly after 11.30 a.m., Forrest's rebel troopers arrived on the ridge line east of Spring Hill and were steadily forcing back the small federal force that opposed them. A federal cavalryman dashed south toward the wagon train security that was still nearly a mile south of town. General David Stanley was the 4th Corps commander and had ridden in that morning with Wagner's division of his corps. The cavalryman was clearly frightened and explained that rebel cavalry under Forrest was near at hand. General Stanley wasted no time and had the wagons moved to the side of the road and rushed Wagner's division forward at a run. In moments, Colonel Opdyke, with his lead brigade, were sprinting the last half mile or more into town. They arrived just in time. His regiments quickly deployed on Main Street between the buildings encompassing the town and provided a screen on the northern and northeastern approaches to the village. Rushing toward the town in rear of Opdyke's brigade, Colonel John Q. Lane rushed his men north and east into the fringes of the village, while the final brigade of Wagner's division under Brigadier General Luther P. Bradley left the road filing into the fields south and east of the village to gain an eminence that overlooked the approaches along Rally Hill Pike. The reserve artillery also galloped headlong into town, bypassing the wagon trains, and in less than half an hour, at least six batteries of artillery, comprising no less than 36 cannon, had deployed throughout the village. Two rebel divisions of cavalry had arrived on the ridge line east and north of Spring Hill. One brigade charged headlong into the eastern flank, racing up the hill towards the city cemetery twice, but was repulsed both times by dismounted ca cavalry and the wagon guard. Shortly thereafter, 
General Forrest arrived and ordered General Chalmers to conduct an assault. He too was repulsed, after assuring General Forrest that it was already heavily defended. By 3 p.m. the Confederate infantry had begun to arrive, about two and a half miles southeast of Spring Hill. General Hood quickly crossed his lead corps under Cheatham. Cheatham was given specific orders to seize the pike to complete the trap. At this hour, the Federal main body is still in front of Columbia. 3 o'clock p.m. that afternoon, about the time Hood has arrived with the infantry, Schofield starts to move his main body back towards Spring Hill, realizing he's not going to be hit in flank as he anticipated. Now, only the worst luck, or worst leadership, can create a failure. 